Alright, so this will be another short video here on uh, plasticity. We're talking about dilatational strain or volumetric strain in incompressible plastic flow, and we're going to see where that comes from. Well, we've talked about our normality flow rule, and we came up with the equation d epsilon plastic, plastic strain increments is equal to d lambda n dot d sigma in. And what uh, volumetric strain is, if we look at the small strain formulation, volumetric strain, so people represent this as epsilon sub v, you can think of this as the change in volume over the initial volume of the material. Of course, if epsilon v is equal to zero, uh, then the material is incompressible. Right now, if we have an incompressible material and the volume doesn't change, uh, we can come up with a relationship among the uh, plastic strains in the x, y, and z directions, or the one, two, and three directions, for uh, a, a general equation. We can have this approximately represented as epsilon x plus epsilon y plus epsilon z. So if we add these three strain components together and we end up with zero, then we have an incompressible material. Now let's think about what happens in a uniaxial stress state if we have elastic material behavior. Let's just say we have a stress sigma x. Well, in that case, sigma x is equal to, epsilon x is equal to sigma x over e. Epsilon y and epsilon z are equal to each other. If we have an isotropic material, they're both equal to minus nu sigma x over e. So if we add these two, uh, add these three strains together, we have sigma x over e minus two nu sigma x over e we have, uh, let's see, 1 over e, 1 minus 2 nu sigma x equal to 0. Now, on, well, there's not going to be equal to 0, equal to the volumetric strain. Now, given that Poisson's ratio for most materials is between uh, 0.3 and uh, up to 0.5, maybe you get 0 0.2, 0 0.25 even, well, for elastic material behavior, we do have a change in volume. Mass is conserved, but volume is not conserved. We can have a change in density of the material when we have elastic uh, material behavior. Well, let's take a look at our uh, normality flow rule and how we calculate the plastic strains for a hydrostatic stress independent material and let's see what kind of dilatational strain we get in that case. All right, so first let's take a look at this uh, from I guess more of a, a general perspective. If I write this, uh, if I wanted the trace of the plastic strain increments That's the, the volumetric strain. Then uh, we would have d epsilon i i plastic. So d epsilon x plastic plus d epsilon y plastic plus d epsilon z plastic. That would be equal to d lambda. N dot d sigma in terms of increments would be like, uh, let's see, N, N, M, D sigma, N, M, where we have a summation implied. And our increment uh, and our normal vector, N 
uh, I I. Okay, we need to have these match this one because this is uh, we need to add up the three plastic strain components. Now, in general, N I J is the partial derivative of f with respect to s i j. We showed how partial of f with respect to x i j, same as partial of f with respect to sigma i j. And to make this a unit normal vector, we're going to take the square root, and we're going to have the partial derivative of uh, f with respect to maybe s k l, partial derivative of f with respect to s k l. We're going to take the square root of that, so now we have this as a unit vector. Now then NII is going to be equal to uh, the partial of F with respect to SII. Now this is a summation. Now we still have this partial F, partial SKL, partial F, partial SKL, square root of that down on the bottom. Uh, but if we interpret this as the trace, the DV torque stress tensor, that's J1. And if we have a hydrostatic stress insensitive material, so it's a function most of only J2 and J3, Well, then by taking the partial derivative of that function f with respect to j1, we end up with 0. And then the trace, the plastic strains, is equal to 0. Now, if this works on increments, it works on total strains as well. So what that means is when we have plastic flow, for hydrostatic stress and sensitive materials, we end up with uh, volume conserving plastic flow. Now, since we talk a lot about the J2 plasticity theory, we can also do this specifically for J2. In this case, uh, Nij would be equal to Sij uh, because the partial of if I get my note, partial of F with respect to Sij when uh, F is equal to J2. It would be, in this case, uh, if I had to find it this way, it would be 2Sij. So we'd have 2Sij, and then we'd have, on the bottom, 2 SKL, 2 SKL, and then the square root of that. Of course, the 2's would cancel out. We'd end up with SIJ and uh, the square root of SKL, SKL on the bottom. Then NII would be equal to SII over this on the bottom, SKL, SKL, square root of that. And so then D epsilon I J plastic equal to D lambda N dot D sigma N I I, which would be equal to zero because that term uh, goes to zero. So again, uh, specifically for J2. or a von Mises-based plasticity theory. Now I got a chance to do some impact experiments with uh, Professor Dr. Stan Jones here at the University of Alabama. And in an impact experiment that we did, uh, it was a ballistics experiment, terminal ballistics, it's called a Taylor test. We take a, a copper cylinder and we shoot it out of a gun, it has some uh, initial velocity, it comes over and hits a target, 
very hard steel target. It deforms and it bounces off and then we pick it up and take a look at it. When that is done deforming, what it looks like is something like this. If I can draw this okay. Okay, so this is the impacted specimen. Uh, we do, we've done copper and things. And then we take this and we measure it. Now, there's a certain region where it's undeformed. So it has the same diameter as the original specimen before it was shot. There's a region where it has kind of a seemingly straight sloping line. And then it has this, what they call the the mushroom end of the specimen. And uh, one of the things I was able to do with some of the specimens that we tested is I took them in and I had them measured with a coordinate measuring machine. And I have a profile measurement all along the length of this cylinder. So I have all these little data points for a radial line that goes along here. And what I like to do for one of my homework problems for my students in plasticity is to have them calculate the initial and final volume of one of these specimens. Since this is a recovered specimen, all the elastic strains are gone. All we're left with is plastic strains. So if you take and you add up all the volumes and you sweep it around 360 degrees from point to point, you can get an estimate of what that final volume is. And it's really pretty close to the initial volume. Now, there's a little bit of error. If we don't have a completely axisymmetric impact, um, we'll get a little bit of error. Uh, sometimes there's a little indentation here where it initially hits. So this actually comes out here just a little bit. Uh, but uh, typically, we'll see uh, up to 97% of the undeformed volume being recovered from the deformed volume. So this just goes to show that the uh, conservation of plastic strains in metals, volume conserving metals, uh, hydrostatic stress and sensitive metals, is a, a real and observable phenomenon. So let's just write this down. Conservation of volume due to plastic flow Uh, is uh, observable. And uh, perhaps I'll make this, uh, maybe I'll make a different video where I work through this homework problem at some point. All right, so that's what I wanted, I wanted to say about uh, the rotational strain, conservation of plastic flow um, for hydrostatic stress and sensitive materials, and specifically as we use uh, the J2 flow theory.